unlike any you've ever heard. Meet Nick today, recovering from alcohol and loving life. I am redeemed. I'm J. Michael McCoy, and this is the Monday edition of Recovery Monday. I, I didn't say that right, did I, Doc? Uh, it's because it's uh, all it's only on Mondays, so there's no other right. edition than Monday. Right, right. Okay. You were good to so say. So it's just Recovery Monday. Right. Okay. Uh, guest host today, of course, Lila Stafford from uh, Powell CDC. Bob Monster at the Cat in the Hat watching the chat. Um, what do I, what, what do you want to be called? Now, are you, because you're like a pastor now, right? Didn't you pass your seminary test or something? Uh, no, I went under care and presbytery, but thanks. You went under what? Care and presbytery. I don't know what that means. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's Father Tattoo running the show, and Dr. Mike Hartwig, who is on with us for Restoring Hope, uh, is uh, sitting in today. And we're going to introduce you to a young man by the name of Nick Sinclair. Nick, how are you? Great, great. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. It's nice to have you here today. And you are uh, a former patient at Powell CDC. Yes, sir. Yep. I I went through Powell a few years ago for alcohol uh, treatment and um, since then kind of stayed in touch and ended up getting a job there as a secretary. Uh, I kind of do the front desk work and I get to see people come in and, and at their lowest point, I get to see them leave at their highest point. So it's a wonderful Wonderful gig. Do you ever get to, you know, wander down the hall and visit people and share your story with them? I definitely do. Yeah. They let me do that. Yeah. Which is really nice. You know, my uh, supervisor and employers are very kind enough to let me add my my own story to the mix. Good. 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 All right. Um, And Lila, nice to see you and uh, nice to have Powell CDC here with us today. Anything exciting happening at Powell CDC this week? You have a you have a, a run, don't you? Yeah. Boy, am I glad you said that. Thanks. Saturday. Um, this Saturday. This Saturday, and it's in the uh, north parking lot of Lutheran Hospital. It's um, You can s- sign up online. You can go to our Facebook page and find out all the details, or you can sign up there. It, you can sign up at 8 o'clock. It's $15 for a 5K, and you get a T-shirt and some prizes. Or you can just walk, and it's free. Okay. And you can bring kids, family. Bring everybody you know. And do you have a name for it? Yes. But you don't remember what it is. <laughs> Rick, uh, okay. I just saw the flyer, too. Okay. You Bob, that? you might want to do a little yeah, research. Yeah, it's the Powell Fun Run. Powell Fun Run. Okay. Powell <laughs> Fun Run. All right. And that's coming up this Saturday. Correct. All right. We'll talk about that. How, how far is 15K? Oh, no, uh, it's a 5K. 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 Oh, 5K. Well, how far is 5K? It's like three miles, right? That sounds right. It's They're going to go down around the farmer's than market Max ever and then run. come back. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> so, yeah, I think it's like three, three a little miles. over three miles, three something miles. like that, Bob. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, yeah, Father Tattoo, we don't have headphones on in here, some of the guests, so they can't hear you. That's all right. You heard me. You, I didn't hear anything you said. <laughs> all right, Nick, um, where's home? Uh, I grew up in Beaverdale here in Des Moines, okay. and uh, currently I'm living in Cumming, Iowa. All right. Um, so when you were growing up in Beaverdale, what was the first, uh, mem- uh, remembrance memory you have of drinking alcohol? Probably seeing my, um, older brothers. I have three older brothers and they're all, you know, my best friends. Um, but I'd see them tinker around with it in high school and experiment and, and everything. And, um, the first time I ever tried it, it probably should have been a big clue for me because my first drink ended in a police car ride home to my parents' house. Wow. Yeah, we got busted out at Sailorville um, for drinking out there and camping with my older brother. Um, but, uh, you know, it didn't phase me. It just continued on in high school. And um, the so whole. That night, what, that night, did you get drunk? Or did you just. No. Get- and I was upset about that at the time. <laughs> <laughs> you wanted to get drunk. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it was it was the first time, and I I'd seen my brothers 
kind of under the influence, so to speak. And, right. you know, I kind of wanted to experience that. I think I was in eighth grade or a freshman or something oh. like that. So um, it was something that I was very curious about. Straight beer or... Yeah, I think alcohol? like Schlitz malt oh. liquor, maybe. Or oh, something. yeah, baby. <laughs> oh, buddy. <laughs> I, went, I went down hard that night, too. Uh, that's right. right. <laughs> you know, you do a little half and half with a ham's bear, and you're in good shape, right. let me tell you. <laughs> All right, so um, um, do you remember the first taste? I mean, do you remember y- your your body reacting, your mind reacting to that, that soothing taste of alcohol? Well, I don't remember the first taste, but I remember the first time in my life when I felt like I could not live without it. And it was, um, you know, as a young adult and, uh, you know, at Powell, they talk about Dr. Weiss used to talk about the, um, when that part in your brain trips and you can't go back, you know, and you've triggered that, that section in your brain that, you know, you're addicted to it. Now you need it. It's a, it's a addiction. So what led up to that? Um, well, and by the way, how old were you at that? At I was probably, I think 25 at that time. Oh, okay. So you weren't like in high school. No, right? no. And I drank off and on. Um, but, uh, kind of my story was after high school, you know, I had my little drinking buddies, but nothing serious. Um, and then, uh, my brother and I, my brother, Josh, um, we played in a band for a number of years and, um, instead of going to college, I was able to play professionally in a band. So we went what, out. What kind of music? Um, pop rock, like folk rock. He played acoustic guitar and I played drums. And, oh, cool. um, you know, we kind of did our thing around Des Moines. And you had enough to keep your business going and keep it in the yeah, yeah, and all that. Yeah, yeah. actually, um, we got signed to a label in New York in um, 2001. So we were able to do that professionally for a number of years, which was awesome. I mean, it was incredible. Um, it was great to do with him and share that experience, you know, still no, no heavy drinking. Um, which in, coming from that environment, that's pretty hard to do yeah, isn't it? because it, it's everywhere. Absolutely. And I would see that stuff, you know, in yeah. the studios and kind of be like, ugh, you know, it doesn't really appeal too much. So it hadn't kicked in yet. Right, right. And when we started getting on the road a lot and having these long periods away and I had gotten married um, and I was really, you know, I think homesick at the time. I started really picking up my drinking to okay, escape. So what I hear you saying is a bad marriage has led you to be an alcoholic. Is that what you're saying? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe being a bad husband. Ah, okay. <laughs> you know, just being gone from her and, ah. and wanting to be home and not knowing how to reconcile that. Um, wow. So I escaped into drinking and, you know, we'd spend three months or so on the road and it was great and we'd come home and it was wonderful, you know, and we'd come right back and be in that honeymoon phase and, um, Unfortunately for me, I couldn't stop the party that I had that I had started to live in while we were on the road and playing, you know, sure. playing shows and staying up late and partying and, you know, you go all out. And I had gotten into that at the, by that point. Um, but yeah, once I uh, once we came home, I just couldn't turn it off. I didn't want to turn it off, I guess. And so she was not a party girl. Right. Um, <laughs> she was a party girl. Bless her heart. Uh she was a party girl and we, we used to party together pretty good. Um, and then when we realized that I was, well, when she told me I had a problem, I'm like, what? Come on. But, uh, she could see long before I could, that I was drinking alcoholically and it was really affecting who I was. Okay. When you say drinking al- uh, alcoholically, tell me what that means. Is that how often is that time of day? Is that consumption? Is that um, to me, it means it, it meant that I started to hide booze from her. Mm. You know, when we would drink together, um, you know, we'd go out and have a few pictures or whatever, and it'd be fine. And I started getting to the point where I needed more and more to get that feeling back. And so I started to hide it around the house. And when I couldn't hide beer so easily, I made the bad mistake of switching to vodka because mm. I could just hide it in a little bottle. And um, so I would end up completely hammered every night and, you know, falling into furniture, um, you know, getting in arguments. And she's just wondering, well, what's going on? We've only had a few drinks, you know, but I had had, you know, 20. Um, 
So she knew there was definitely more to the story than I was a lightweight, and she started to find things around the house. And I think the big thing that really showed how destructive my behavior was becoming was the lying that came along with it, you know, because I was ashamed of what I was doing because she was asking me not to do it. You know, my family saw me in a downward spiral, so because of that shame and I didn't I wanted everyone to think I was okay I made the big mistake of starting to lie and the lies just kept Mm. going on top on top on top we are uh, live on a Monday with Recovery Monday I'm J. Michael McCoy Uh, this program brought to you by Powell CDC our guest is Nick he is a graduate of Powell CDC and you are so right uh, the line Uh, the line and the deceit uh, Absolutely. begins to cause terrible heartache within an individual, especially resentments, and uh, that cannot be good. So you said that about 25 years old is when something happened. Yeah. Um, oddly enough, I was in in the restroom at Felix and Oscar's, and it was my brother's birthday party, and um, we'd all had a couple of drinks before dinner, and I was standing there looking in the mirror, you know, drying my hands off. And I just had the feeling of, I just, this feeling that I feel right now, this buzz, I want to feel this. I need to feel this for the rest of my life. And I can't feel any other way. And I'll do whatever it takes to have it every single second of every single day. And it was scary, but it was so vivid that I didn't know what else to do other than just to chase it. You know, I had had no experience with any 12 step work or, um, you know, alcoholism in my family. And it almost felt like a spiritual, like a negative spiritual thing, you know, the negative spiritual awakening. Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. A gripping. Yeah. Is that what you mean? Is that the the alcohol was coming in and it was saying, you got to get this? Absolutely. And I knew right then that it was more powerful than I was in that moment. So you went out and went to the rest of the party and did my thing for another six months. And, you know, it just got worse and worse and worse. And how so it got worse and worse? um, Like more and more? uh, Yeah, drinking more and more, um, you know, passing out all the time Mm -hmm. at, at home. Um, no, you. By the way, you didn't have any kids. No, here at this point. no. Okay, okay. Thank God. Yeah, no kids. And your wife is still hanging with you. And yeah, seeing this happen. Yeah, wow. and you know she's an amazing woman. She stood by a lot, you know, and really helped me. I Did mean, you ever sense that she was alcoholic or had alcoholic tendencies? No, because and it, we kind of have a running joke between her and me because when I uh, when I went I went to see like a counselor and you know, talk through my problems one-on-one, which was great and everything, but it obviously didn't solve my problem. Um, We said, okay, let's stop drinking. We'll do it together. And so she has like, I don't know, it's 75 more days sober than I do or something like that because she was able (laughs) just to stop, right? right. you know, and I couldn't stop. So So what was the pivot point where you said, all right, this is a problem. I got to see, I got to do something about this. Well, to be very honest with you, uh, my family and my wife were my pivot point because I think if it hadn't been for them, I don't know if I would be there yet. Did they all gather in your living room and say, we've got a, we got a serious problem? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and when I saw the tears and, you know, they all wrote letters and, um, I mean, it was a very kind intervention, you know, uh, it wasn't like accusatory or anything like that, but... So, so had had you had you did you give your wife the impression that you had quit while she was abstaining yeah. from alcohol, but yet you kept drinking? Yes, absolutely. Did yeah. she find that out? Oh yeah, she would find it out because I'd be I'd be hammered, hammered, drunk every night. All right, great story. Nick is here. Powell CDC. He's going to play his guitar for us a little later. He's a great musician, and he wrote a song called "Pray, Hope, and Don't Worry." Don't worry, be happy. Hey, yeah, I can do that one too. No, 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 no. no. Uh, Dr. Mike Hartwig is here. Lila Stafford is here. Bob Monserrat <laughs> is here. And Father Tattoo is here. And thank heavens you're here. 
because I love this job and I couldn't do it without you on KTIA, Iowa. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. If Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of America was your personal webmaster, Tom would filter out all bad debt emails. If Tom was your mailman, you'd never get any debt reduction junk mail. If Tom Coates was a lineman, he'd block any phone calls offering to reduce your credit card debt. Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America, and we're still your best choice for credit counseling. We're local, we're accountable, and we can do more. You make the call when the time's right for you. When it comes to competition, there really is none for Consumer Credit of America. toward another heart attack. A woman who struggles daily with diabetes and her memory. A boy whose headaches keep him out of school. A mother who one morning discovers a lump. A girl whose condition defies diagnosis. You come to us because you need answers, but you also need more. You need understanding of what you're going through. You need comfort. You need to be treated as an individual, not a condition. You need to be included in your own care. You are the point of everything we do. That's why we're changing to Unity Point Health. It's a model of care that will help us work better together, where the physician who knows you best takes the lead, coordinating your care through every step, from the hospital to specialists, to rehabilitation, to health services in the home and in the community, to making sure the treatments are effective, by working as a team, we surround you with care, helping you manage your health and your conditions, guiding you to making better choices and living a healthier life. The point of unity is you. Unity Point Health. Great sandwiches. Oops, sorry. Uh, 21 minutes after 3 of the 15th day of July. I, I said I didn't know him. My producer didn't. He failed to let me. And we were on and Sandwich came out. I was talking about BNP. Uh, Nick is Sandwich our guest. Often Powell, with you. CDC is uh, his employment. But before that, he was a uh, client. Patient? Client? What do you call him? Both, okay. At uh, Powell CDC, Lila Stafford is here, and of course, I've got Dr. Michael Hartwig uh, in today uh, from our Restoring Hope program, and Bob Mozzaret, uh the Cat in the Hat. All right, so your family uh, puts on an intervention. Yeah. Can I ask you a question about that? Who initiated that? My wife. Your wife gathered the rest of the family. Yeah, because we're all pretty close. Um, wow, that took amazing guts. Was there a counselor there? No, no. Later on, there was like we did the same kind of thing while I was at Powell um, with the family counselors. But um, really, she kind of, you know, I owe her so much because I probably wouldn't be here without her. What what kind of a drunk were you? Um, I was a, a lying drunk, but I was just a. I want to drink myself into oblivion. I don't want to feel anything. I don't want to exist. Yeah, I so just, you, you didn't put the lampshade on your head? You weren't the angry guy? Well, at first, back in the day, before before that, I used to be the I love you guy. Okay. And um, I, I thought, love you guy, meaning, uh, and here's a like, drink? No, he'd walk no. around with a drink, and he'd walk up to you and say, you know, my, I just love you. Exactly. <laughs> you're, you're just, you're like my favorite Pastor slash dog <laughs> in the whole world. I love you. I love you. Absolutely. Right? That's it. That's okay. right. Me and Foster Brooks. 
<laughs> That's right. And then that turned into, um, you know, when people started getting pretty annoyed by that, which I think happened fairly quickly, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, um, you know, I just started drinking to escape. Um, you know, and part of that was because the band, we kind of took a hiatus. Our, we weren't on the road so much, you know, so I wasn't uh, bringing in the income like I was when we first got married. My wife's working full time. Yeah, I'm wondering what I'm going to do as a guy with just a high school education and had this awesome career that now is very questionable future. Um, so I was pretty bummed out. Bummed out is a big, is a yeah. very good word. You know, wondering where I fit in as a man, as a husband. Sure. You're um, not the breadwinner. Exactly. You're at home while she's at work. Exactly. Probably so, she comes home frustrated that you haven't done what you need to do and you're drunk again. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And you it think was, I knew this story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> how do you know that it's one? It's my story too. <laughs> Isn't that funny? So well, any DUIs? No. Good thank, for you. Thank the Lord I didn't have any legal trouble. Yeah. All right, so your wife puts together an intervention. The family comes together, and their their deal is what? You're going to go to Powell or what? Um, basically, I'm either going to go to Powell or she was going to leave me. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And right. the family supported that? Absolutely. Was, wow. Yeah. She was laying it all on the line. And and at that point, when I, when I had my moments of lucidity, you know, after a big drunk and, you know, the next morning or whatever, um, I wouldn't blame her. You know, I'd say, yeah, you probably should leave. I mean, in my heart, at least I said that, you know, this is no life for right. her, you know. Yeah. Did you, when she hit you with that, do you, was there a temptation for you to say something like, well, if you're going to put it that way, go ahead and leave and just walk out? I um, I think I did have those conversations with her, you know, and I did have my moments of anger. I mean, most definitely because I was angry at myself and I took it out on the person that I love the most and closest to me. Um, so, you know, as much as it is hard to say, I took a lot of anger out on her that she didn't deserve in any way. Um, but, uh, really I, I just wanted to keep her. Is that her calling me? <laughs> she, Honey, she says, come she home. Says, she said, she's texting. Is this ha, is this, do I have to run this like a 12-step meeting and remind people before the meeting to turn their phones off? It's my daughter. She's getting married this Saturday, so okay. give her a little grace. That's right. valid, I guess. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, but uh, the day that I was driving to Powell and my wife was in such tears that she couldn't talk and I'd never seen her like that before. And I knew it was because she loved me and she wanted better for me and for herself. That was a big changing day for me. Like that still sticks in my head. Um, and I wish I could say that it all changed right then. You know, it didn't. I mean, there was a lot of ups and downs after that, but that moment seeing her so distraught and despaired in this woman that I love and pledge my life to, I'm destroying, you know, I've hurt her so deeply. That was a big moment for me. Were you inpatient or outpatient? Um, I was outpatient. Um, I don't know, for some reason, working there now, I'm like, I, I'll come inpatient here and hang out over the weekend. They, you know, the beds are nice, the food's great. Um, but at the time, as a patient, I was so scared to do inpatient. So I just said, you know, I'd, I want to do outpatient. I'll do this thing. You know, I'm not happy about it but don't make me do inpatient. Um, did that for a week. You, wait, you wait, hold on. You had that attitude? Yeah. Okay. Why? Well, I just, it, uh, I had a different picture painted. I had a picture of surrender painted mm. that you loved your wife and wanted that relationship so bad that, that you had succumb, surrendered to the idea that you were going to go through treatment. Well, and, and absolutely. But that, I wanted to want it. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that grip was still there so, so much. And that's, I think why the lies came because I wanted the illusion of recovery. You know, even I couldn't, I couldn't attain it. Um, but I was, I went to Powell. My first day I called my wife from uh, the payphone downstairs at the hospital and said, you know, can you come get me because these people are really crazy. I have nothing in common with them and I cannot do this. And she said, 
she you know teared up and said just please give it one day just one day and by the end of the day when she came and picked me up I said you know I think this could be really good for me if even if I'm not an alcoholic because honestly it took me years to admit I was an alcoholic really yeah years I just didn't want to I don't know pride or whatever but um you know, I thought, well, I can learn something from this program. And I started to like it and listen. Um, but I ended up drinking still while I was an outpatient. Um, and I went and stayed with my parents who live uh, on a farm out in Madison County. Um, and so they provided me kind of a safe place and a place to be away from her to give her space, give okay. me space and focus on my treatment. And But you'd get home at the end of the day from treatment and you'd drink. No, just that one time, just that one time from, um, like I was in treatment for a week as an outpatient and then I had a weekend bender and then it was either you're going to go inpatient or you're going to come out and live with mom and dad because this isn't working. So I said, well, I'll come out and live with mom and dad. And then I really started taking treatment more seriously and I started getting involved, you know, once I, you know, just listening, but doing the work to, you know, listening to what the counselors had to say and, trying to help people at the same time. Like when I was able to give feedback in the community room and help newcomers after I'd only been there a few weeks, I started to feel pride in myself or not pride, but proud of myself that I hadn't felt in years. You know, like I was worth something. I had something to give. How old are you now at this time? Not now, but at that. Um, I was 27, 27, 27. Yeah. Okay. How old are you now? 31. 31. Okay. So you've been sober four years. Mm-hmm. Congratulations. How Thank many days you, is it? One, one day. I woke up at 6 a.m. today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's good. I like yeah. that. Um, so I can't, what, what, if there's a change at, that you heard in Powell, what changed that in that first day in particular? Is there anything that stands out in your mind? That's a good question, because because halfway into the break in the morning, get me out of here, and by yeah, the right. end of the day, it's I think I'll stay. Right. You know, I honestly can't remember what that one thing was, but um, I think when we went into small group, because I, it was a little bit different format than what it is now. Yeah. Like the day, how the day's set up. Um, so, like, I think the first couple things I attended were, you know, a lecture and a small group or a lecture in a education. And then when I went to small group and I started hearing people tell their stories and I could totally relate to it. And I was, you know, seeing their heart and their hurt and their desire for more. Um, I thought do you that's any, exactly what I want. Do you see anybody who is worse off than you? Yeah, absolutely. And you saw, did you see yourself kind of, if I don't do something, I'm going to be them. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I still see that today. I mean, you know, working at the front desk, it's a, it's a huge gift for me because, you know, I'm the secretary there. I do a lot of paperwork, but I remember how scared I was on that first day. And I didn't know anybody. I'm there all alone. You know, I'm being, people want me to change my life and I have no idea how, and I'm in this treatment center and I was so scared so that's the one big thing that really I feel like is a calling for me at this job now that I work today as a secretary is to just be friendly and yeah. smile and make them feel welcome because I remember feeling so scared and I know that they're scared, you know. And Do you develop a partner in, in that, somebody that you could really relate to, somebody that you kind of kind of hit it off with and you said, yeah, we can go through this together. That's um, I, I did make some good friends. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Some really good friends. There was a, a big guy that became a really great friend of mine. Um, you still stay in contact with him? Um, just a couple of them, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. But I see him out at meetings and everything. And sure. that's, that's really cool. You know, even though we don't talk so much, uh, you know, it's neat to see and just to reconnect a little bit and say, Hey buddy, you know, good to see you yeah, again, yeah. you know, cause it's like you're on the front lines together yeah. when you're in treatment kind of. Yeah. Uh, kind of along the same lines as Dr. Hartwig uh, said, uh, what was one of the things in those first few whatever days, weeks, months in which you went, I can do this? Somebody said something, somebody shared a story, and you said, I can do this. Well, a big, a big one for me was um, 
Dr. Weiss, the uh, medical director there, when he first saw me, he I had a broken hand because I had punched the floor um, in a drunken rage. And he said, well, that's typical alcoholic behavior. And I'll never forget what he said that. And I'm like, who is this guy? You know, he doesn't know me. Get out of here. I don't even, you know, and he, he has kind of a gruff persona, but he has the biggest heart, you know, and thank the Lord I'm able to call him my friend today. I mean, I never thought that that would be like that. But when he said that, when he said that's typical al- alcoholic behavior and then said a couple other things and then left, I thought, this guy doesn't know me. He doesn't know nothing about me. I'm going to prove him wrong. <laughs> and it, But I dove into it enough that after a week or two, I thought, he knows exactly who I am. Yeah. He knows exactly who I am and what I'm about. Yeah, I'll never forget uh, uh, one of my first meetings after quitting drinking. I walked into a meeting, and uh, there was a gentleman there who I had known for years and years and years. He was a vendor of mine. He took care of some different things in my businesses. And he walked up, and he put his arm around me, and he said, I've been waiting for you. I knew you'd be coming through these doors. <laughs> And I didn't know what he meant, and I was a little offended by that. Mm -hmm. And then later on, I realized when I took a look at my behaviors, it was obvious to him and anybody else around that I had a problem. And it stemmed from, well, as I'm sure we'll talk about in the next series, it doesn't stem from alcohol. Alcohol just intensifies it and makes it worse. Yeah. So uh, Nick is our guest. Uh, Lila is here from Powell CDC. I'm Mac, and I appreciate you listening to Recovery Monday, uh, sponsored by Powell CDC. And we'll be back right after this, live here on webcast1live.com. I'm Brian Leach, owner and general manager of Service Legends. Oh, I brought uh, along a couple of the uh, home comfort heroes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tammy Wells. I am Nick Wondershot. I'm administrative manager. I'm the senior technician. From Service Legends. It seems like every good thing, when you feel it to the bone that it's good, there's a lot of hard work put behind it. You just, I, I don't think that you can fake it and have it turn out good. You know, if we seem like, okay, that's just weird, it's just a furnace, why would you believe so deeply in a furnace? It's not just that, you know, we want to show the world that you can have good service. Yeah, I mean, it's gotta be, it's your home. You know, it's, it's built into our daily trainings, it's built into our culture, um, that we're gonna do whatever it takes to have each client say they love us, period. That's why we spend all the hours in the training that we do, and if we guarantee it's gonna be a good experience for you, or else it's free, what type of work do you think we're gonna do? <laughs> there is a guarantee. Temperature selection guarantee, fixed rider it's free guarantee, comfort guarantee, best value guarantee, all of these guarantees hold us accountable to ensuring that we exceed your expectations. And if for whatever reason we'd fail and we can't make it right, we guarantee all of those guarantees with a 100% money back guarantee. I mean, if you don't think that your technician can fix it right, are you going to say that to a client? No. <laughs> you don't have to worry about having a technician come to your house. We drug test, background check all of our team members. We put safe people in your home. Each and every one of our service techs, 400 hours a year in training. You tell it the minute they walk in the door. They know what they're doing, they've done their homework, and they actually truly care about what you want. Because at the end of the day, you're the person that makes sure I have a job. They're going to be listening. They're going to want to know what your challenges are. Then they're going to come and give you options, and, and you get to choose. If I'm there to help and I make it easy and painless, I did my job right that day. Well, when it comes to your comfort, safety, and your family, you know, you don't necessarily go buy the most expensive, but you get the most bang for your buck. Oh, it's worth it because there's a lot of people that will find a way to get it to work right now and then leave and then come back, charge you again, and, and the cycle just repeats itself. So when I'm out there looking at the furnace, I want to find why it failed the day. How can we change the part today with something that you're not going to have to worry about? Is it worth changing the part today? I mean, you can put a lot of money into a furnace. I can fix parts all day. There's good job security in that for me. But is it the right thing for you? I get a lot of the phone calls of after the technicians are there. They're just in awe. They're like, wow, you guys are great. I mean, I don't even know what to say. You guys are great. Everything you did is perfect. It's great. <laughs> Keep going, though. I like this. <laughs> just give us a try. I'm going to take all the risk. I've got the time to make this right. I've got the support to make it right. Just check us out. And if you don't see the value in what we do. I mean, fixed writer, it's free or 100% money back. Enough said.
22 minutes before the top. Salem Radio Network News, and then Michael Mudloff with True Blue here on webcast1live.com and 99.3 KTIA. Tomorrow, uh, in the view from a pew, we're going to have a incredible show. Uh, in the light of the Martin and Zimmerman case, I've asked a man who I have an unbelievable amount of respect for, and that's Akeo Samad, uh, to come into the studio tomorrow with Tom Coates and I, and we're going to talk about this thing. And we're not going to talk lightly. We're going to talk the truth. We're going to take off the uh, PC uh, barriers and, and rose-colored glasses, and we're going to have a tough conversation uh, about what is going on in this case because it's turned into an American nightmare. It has turned into a racist, uh, you against me, terribly mean-spirited, uh, and that's on both sides. Uh, Martin is probably, or not Martin, Zimmerman is probably going to sue NBC for defamation of character for when they edited the 911 calls back-to-back and it made it sound like he was a racist. Uh, and NBC shouldn't have done that. And I don't know what will happen with that suit. Then on the other hand, the White House is encouraging the Justice Department to consider a uh, lawsuit against Zimmerman for uh, the loss of Trayon Martin's uh, civil rights. Really? I don't get either side. Okay? It, it is what it is, and the jury said what it was. Why aren't we done? Well, that's because we live in a country that we have freedom of speech and some people don't know when to shut up. I always told Bradshaw, just because you have the right to say it doesn't mean you should say it. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of that's being said right now. And I can't think of anybody better than a KO to come in here and tell us how he's thinking. So that's tomorrow here on The View from a Pew. Today, my guest is Nick. Uh, Nick, he is a uh, employee of Powell CDC, but prior to that, he was a patient after a family held an intervention. And his wife, is it fair to say, his what your wife said, if you don't stop drinking, you're going to lose our marriage. Yeah, absolutely. Was she serious? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Why, what do you think motivated her to say that? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I, I really think what motivated her was because she loved me and couldn't watch me spiral down until I was dead. Yeah, so she's willing to walk away from you? Yeah. And you sense that? Yeah. I, to me, I think where I've seen these and heard these stories where they, they work, mm -hmm. in, like in your cases, that um, they, the, the person that's being confronted like that has this undeniable sense that this person cares for me. Yeah. And then the people that it doesn't work with, it, they, it, they feel like they're being attacked. And they mm -hmm. feel like you probably felt some of that too, but still at the end of the day, you, you understood and you were smart enough to recognize she's motivated by her passion for it. Absolutely. For you. Yeah. yeah. And when, when now that happened, you know, with my family, when everyone sat around and, and, and read their letters, um, you know, by that point I was in Powell and uh, the family counselors asked my brothers and my parents and my wife to all read letters saying what they, um, what they hated about when I was drunk. And that was hard to hear. And that did kind of feel like an attack, you know? Um, and then they all went around and read letters to me about what they love about me when I'm sober. And that was mm. beautiful. Mm. Yeah. That was beautiful. And I had so much peace after that. And even I remember my mom saying, I think he's just lying right now trying to get out of this room. But I said, no, mom, I seriously, that touched my heart. You know, it gave me just a lot of peace just to know how much they loved me to the point where they're telling me enough's enough. Okay. Wait, if you were, had somebody listen to this radio, they know somebody who was in your situation, who, mm -hmm. who is in your situation that you were in. What would you say to them? How, how do they go about putting something together like that? You know, every now and then I get I get phone calls on the weekends because um, it's kind of a skeleton staff there at Powell. Um, we have a counselor, but he's doing groups with the patients. Um, so it's, you know, the secretary and the counselor tech up at the front desk and we field the phone calls. And um, what I tell people, and I don't know if this is technically right, but it worked for me. If you're going to approach someone with that kind of a, um, you know, do or die kind of thing. Like, you know, we think you have a problem. You need to get help. We're asking you to get help. I say, do it 
with love in your heart, you know, because they're going to feel attacked. They know it's wrong. That's why they're trying to hide it or, you know, still doing it or, you know, whatever it is. I mean, drugs and alcohol, like you said, Mac, it's just a, a way to cover up some kind of hurt mm-hmm. in your life. So mm-hmm. they're hurting. So I said, you be firm with them, but love them, love them through it, you know? And that's what worked for me. Yeah. And you were smart enough to recognize that. Yeah. Yeah. Why are you? Yeah. Spin like, that in front of you. Why? Yeah. I, I, I bet I know the answer of why you're laughing. Well, because when I gave my husband the ultimatum, I don't remember any love being there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I really meant it. It was like, you quit or I'm out of here. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, Nicholas, has she remained? Well, she does, well that, she doesn't have to remain sober, but she still is? Or? Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Which yeah. is a gift of love to you. Yeah. But let's go back to Lila. What, what do you mean there was no love there? I mean, it's because it was emotional? It was intense? It was... You, you had I hard words? I just had it. I, we both had... You were just mad. We both were misbehaving... Uh. And um, and I just said both of us are going to quit. And if you if you ever drink again, I'm out of here. I just I'd had it with both of our behaviors, um, and I just said that I, was it. Yeah. So what happened when you found out that he had been drinking for four years? Um, actually, my father was on his deathbed, literally, and he looked up at me and he said, "Don't leave this man. He's sick." So then I thought, oh, God, this is my dad's last wish. I cannot leave this man because I would have been out the door. Mm. So I'm, I'm really glad that he said so that. So your dad knew this was going on yes. behind the back? Yes. And he knew that you were the lifeline? Yes. And uh, yes. that could for him. That was pretty so smart. I'm, I'm, glad. I'm glad he asked that of me because it, and it, it wasn't like, well, just like you were saying, it, it wasn't like everything was just magic as soon as he went into treatment. It, it, took, it took us about three years to get mm. back on track. So how'd you find out your husband was drinking? Um, because a FedEx truck came up the driveway up at the lake, and he, he, had, he had been picked up, and I was at the lake. And um, so he wrote me a note. And I knew something was wrong in our marriage, but I didn't know. I thought maybe he was having an affair. I knew something was wrong, but I couldn't pinpoint what it was. He was with a bottle, though. Yes. Yeah. 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 Anyway, he wrote me a letter, and because in my head, I, I knew, no, UPS trucks or FedEx trucks do not come in our driveway ever. So I knew it was a letter from him, and I thought it was going to say, I'm having an affair, I'm out of here. So as I was reading his letter, that's what I was thinking, but it was that he had been picked up. So, And he'd to, been drinking. And he'd been drinking, and he want, He said he was sorry. He wanted to stay with me. And so it didn't seem that bad, because in my mind, I thought he was having the affair. Right. So just the fact that he'd been drinking, was like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's okay. Go to treatment, we'll be okay. Well, and, and the truth ought to be spoken here, too. Lila and Jim are um, a rock as a couple inside of the 12-step program. Sure. They're a rock inside of Powell. And in fact, Jim was the president of Powell, right? Or on the... On the alumni. Yeah, he was alumni. president of the alumni association. Yeah. Wow. Um, and I go to uh, one meeting in which both of them are there. And transparent, um, uh, you said something. Do you remember what you said one day? Uh, well, I say a lot of things that are <laughs> derogatory or joking well, or whatever. You know, part of a 12-step program is you make amends. Mm-hmm. And I had one SOB that I was not going to make an amend to. I don't care what anybody says. And I was at that step. I was in the ninth step, and he was on the list. And that Saturday meeting, Lila said, well, you know, the hardest one I ever had to make was to Jim's ex-wife, and once I did it, everything was just great. And she said, it wasn't that hard to do after I did it. And I thought, you know, if she can do that with an ex-wife, I can do that with this guy who was fairly insignificant in my life but had just right. you made know me mad, and I went after him. About that is that um, I have the opportunity – to um, actually, I asked my stepdaughter today if her mother and she wanted to come over for dinner. Her mother does not live here, and my stepdaughter doesn't live here. But they're, I'm flying my stepdaughter in this weekend and ask if she wanted to have her mother over for dinner. Oh, neat! So that would never have happened before. Yeah, right. but no, that wouldn't have. Very happened. thankful. All right, we are here with uh, Lila and Nick from Powell CDC. Uh, Doc is in the house, and we're coming back. And uh, Nick's going to play a song for us that he wrote about recovery called "Pray Hope and Don't Worry." That's next here live on Recovery Monday, brought to you by Powell CDC.
from the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios. This is Webcast One Live. If Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of America was your personal webmaster, Tom would filter out all bad debt emails. If Tom was your mailman, you'd never get any debt reduction junk mail. If Tom Coates was a lineman, he'd block any phone calls offering to reduce your credit card debt. Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America, and we're still your best choice for credit counseling. We're local, we're accountable, and we can do more. You make the call when the time's right for you. When it comes to competition, there really is none for Consumer Credit of America. A father who is headed toward another heart attack. A woman who struggles daily with diabetes and her memory. A boy whose headaches keep him out of school. A mother who one morning discovers a lump. A girl whose condition defies diagnosis. You come to us because you need answers, but you also need more. You need understanding of what you're going through. You need comfort. You need to be treated as an individual, not a condition. You need to be included in your own care. You are the point of everything we do. That's why we're changing to Unity Point Health. It's a model of care that will help us work better together, where the physician who knows you best takes the lead, coordinating your care through every step, from the hospital to specialists, to rehabilitation, to health services in the home and in the community, to making sure the treatments are effective. By working as a team, we surround you with care, helping you manage your health and your conditions guiding you to making better choices and living a healthier life. The point of unity is you. Unity Point Health. We are back 10 minutes before 4 o'clock on this 15th day of July, and uh, we are celebrating Recovery Monday today with Powell CDC. Uh, Nick is our guest, and uh, just, to, just to wrap up things a little bit, you're still happily married to the woman of your dreams. You now have a wonderful little boy who's almost three. Is that what you said? Yep, he's incredible. His name is Noah. And so what your life is like now is just incredible. It is. You know, there's ups and downs. But yeah, life still happens. Absolutely. But I can deal with it. And, you know, my higher power is working all the time. I mean, seriously, miracles happen every day. And now my eyes are open to them. And I'm just thankful for that. I mean, I can't help but be joyful. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I, I've started asking uh, when I have any say so in the meetings that I go to, I've started asking if we could read the promises because mm -hmm. I find those coming true yeah. in such vivid colors in my life. And it's like, are you kidding me? Yes. Things like this don't happen to me. And so I really enjoy, uh, and, and the promises are a 60 second read on page 83, 84 of the big book. And uh, I suppose you could also Google it and look them up and, and read them and you'll, you'll know what we're talking about. All right, so uh, you wrote a song called Pray, Hope, Pray, I'm sorry, Pray, Hope, and Don't Worry. Yep. Did you write this in recovery? I did, yeah. I actually wrote this one, well, I've written a few songs um, since I've been in recovery and actually recorded a, a CD that um, they sell in the PAL gift shop there, um, but they're all kind of recovery-based music, um, and uh, this one is a newer one for me. Um, because there is a, a saint, uh, Padre Pio, who he's like a little devout monk, you know, who is kind of stone faced, but he is the sweetest person. And one of his favorite things to say that he preached a lot was pray, hope, and don't worry. And I'm like, I can do that. You know, that's easy. You know, I, I'd love to pray, hope, and don't worry. That sounds good to me. So um, it just tied in really well with my recovery and, you know, being myself as a sober person, as a struggling person, as a joyful person, as just who I am. All right, let's hear it. All right. Nick Sinclair with Pray, Hope, Don't Worry. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hurry, hurry, hurry is the sound I hear All of these alarm clocks are ringing in my ear 
Someone gotta help me Cause I don't know what to do I'll take a tip from Padre And I'll get a clue Yeah, and pray Oh Don't worry Why worry When you have hope Whoa, go slow What's your hurry? No worry, no way Just pray Yeah, yeah Whoa, whoa I see the red races running Well, I'm running away I stop thinking about tomorrow And I live today I'ma be myself, forget about the rest Cause when I am myself, that's when me happiest Yeah, and pray, oh Don't worry, why worry When you have hope, won't go slow What's your hurry, no worry, no way Just pray yeah, yeah, whoa, whoa, yeah, catch a raindrop as it falls, watch the flowers bloom, yeah, hear the heartbeat of the world, well, it's in me, whoa, whoa, and it's you, yeah, yeah. Go slow, what's your hurry? No worry, no way, just pray, oh, don't worry, why worry when you have hope? Whoa, go slow, what's your hurry? No worry, no way, yeah. Just pray, yeah, yeah, whoa, whoa, come on and pray. Very good. Yeah, nice. Thank you, guys. you got a great voice. You know what I thought of in the middle of that? What? Uh, I'd like to uh, invite you, encourage you, pay you. Uh, to write a theme song for the show called Recovery Monday. I would be honored. That would be cool. You know, I don't know what it would say, but it's something about, you know, and then we hit Monday and we, I don't know. I'd be honored. That'd Have be fun great. with it. That'd be okay. great. That'd be great. You know who Matt Baird is from the band Spoken? No. You ought to get together with him sometime. He's a great guy. Uh, they're a Christian band. Right on. And they travel the country. And um, You he, fit with him. You, you guys sound a lot. Yeah, you'd love it. Cool. And he, anyway, if you Sounds listen to our Restoring Hope theme song, he wrote that and uh, performed that. Oh, and played okay. that, And it's got a little jingle to it, and then we cut it up and use the music. But Awesome. He's a good guy. We were doing the, uh, do you remember him from Hope? We were, uh, about a year ago, uh, it was time for the offertory hymn. And here comes this guy that's not wet. He's not 100 pounds wet, all right? And he's got no hair and big Buddy Holly glasses, black glasses. And he's got tattoos all over him. And I thought, oh, man, 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 man. And, man, he opened his mouth. And the whole world just stood up and paid attention. And I don't remember what song he sang. It was one of his own. But he rocked the house. And we all stood in an amazing applause. That's incredible. Yeah, it was just, uh, it was amazing. All right, Nick Sinclair, thank you so much for coming in today. I appreciate it. Hope thank you come you. back again. Lila, thanks for uh, bringing him along. We appreciate that. Now, next week, hold on. Next week is, uh, oh, is it, it's Christy. Yeah. No, well, no, you don't know yet. I've got to, I've got to. Look. All right, she's got to check the okay. calendar. Because at some point, aren't we getting Christy and Brad, Chris husband and wife, I thought? Are you happen? No, I don't know. We've had Brad. Christy's coming. Christy's going to be here at the same time Dee is. Okay. And we just don't know if that's next week or the week after. Correct. All right, we'll figure that out. Uh, so how you like hanging around with a bunch of drunks? Uh, yeah. 
It's great. Feel right at home? Are you yeah. ready to admit your character yeah. defects? No, anything to get out of the house. <laughs> anything to get out of the house right now. How, how do you know your daughter's not listening? <laughs> <laughs> she's she's in wedding mode. That's why. She's, she's listening to the program. This Saturday. Yeah. I'm glad I'm hanging out with you guys because it's really tempting. You go get a drink. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, can, we we know how to stop you. This too <laughs> yeah, shall right. pass. Yeah. Yes, yeah. this too shall pass. Well, my role is, is to keep my mouth shut and the checkbook open. Right the checks. Open. Yeah, right That's the check. It. Keep yeah. my checkbook you, you, open. You don't have any resentments over that, do you? Uh, no, at first I did, but no, it's, Not it's good. Yeah. Bob Montret, thanks for being here. Father Tattoo, thanks for producing. I'm J. Michael McCoy. Thanks for watching, and thanks for listening to KTIA Iowa.